All right, welcome to another episode of the In Session podcast brought to you by Air Gigs. I'm David Blacker, and today I had the real pleasure to sit down with the incomparable songwriter, producer, performer, John Lee Sanders. John Lee has worked with literally some of the biggest musical icons of the last 50 years, including Jimmy Page, Stevie Wonder, Willie Nelson, Starship, Bill Withers, Donald Fagan, Steely Dan, Chuck Berry, Randy Newman, Freddie King, Tower of Power, and Bonnie Raitt, who called him literally one of her musical heroes. Our conversation takes us from his earliest roots growing up between Memphis, Jackson, Birmingham, and Monroe, Louisiana, on through being signed to a major production deal with the band Uncle Rainbow, being nominated for an Emmy, right up to the release of his latest album, Tweakin' Some Twang. While comfortable playing in all styles, John's musical roots are very much born out of the intersection of blues, jazz, country, and soul. And his latest release is a real seamless fusion of these styles, so I really encourage everyone to go check it out. Uh, the album's called Tweakin' Some Twang. Our conversation goes way beyond just music, though. We go deep into the historical, cultural, and geographical dynamics that influence these diverse styles, as well as discussing the current state of the music business and how technology is changing things for artists. Well, enough of my talk. Let's jump right into it. John, thanks so much, man, for sitting down with us. I'm really psyched to talk with you. That's just great, man. Yeah, good, good to talk to you in person. Absolutely. You've been with Air Gigs for, for a long time, one of our you know, original members, and uh, we've always been super grateful to, to have you on the site and you know, have someone of your caliber you know, working with our clients. So it's, it's been fantastic. And um, for me, I mean, someone who's you know, deeply into roots music and uh, studied a lot of blues and jazz guitar and all that stuff myself, it's a, pl it's a particular pleasure just because you're so steeped in all that. So I thought we would start, you know, just going back a bit because you have such a, like the geography of your story is so interesting in terms of where, you know, you've, where you originally, you know, where you grew up and, uh, you know, and how you evolved musically and what was going on culturally at that time. It was just such a melting pot of stuff happening. So I thought we'd just start there. It's like you, you grew up in, in Birmingham, right? Well, actually, my, my parents moved to Jackson, Mississippi, when I was three years old, down from from Southern Illinois. And <clears throat> my my father started uh, State Farm Insurance, and that down in the South, and uh, and and Jackson, I, I started piano when I was maybe five, six years old. My mom's side of the family was from Memphis, and my and and her family was very musical. Uh, her uh, first cousin played with W. C. Handy in Memphis, and you know, was a session trombone player, lead singer. And at one of the big society orchestras in Memphis, and uh, so he, uh, you know, that that uh, that side of the family was very musical. My, my grandmother played piano in the silent movies, and but but in, in Mississippi there was so much blues and and, and gospel going on there. It's uh, it was, you know it's a great place to grow up with, with all this music, and uh, so that that's where that's where I got turned on to the blues was Mississippi and the Delta. <clears throat> uh, my, my mother was. She was right way into you know Broadway music and 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 uh, the standards and all that. But but uh, I had an older brother who played the piano. He was playing boogie woogie and and Jerry Lee Lewis and and turned me on to Ray Charles and all that. So I, I had a pretty uh, broad uh, musical upbringing with with all these different uh, styles. But uh, yeah. And did your mom play, or she was just a, a fan? She was uh, she was just a fan. I mean, her her mother played, but. Uh, you know, with right, raising four kids and all that. I mean, I, I, she, she had a great, great ear, and I think she had perfect pitch. But, you know, and and, and she was always pushing me uh, with, with the piano and all these other things. But no, she didn't play. She, she sang in the choir. So what? What was your first? Did did she push you into not push you in a in a rough sense, but like did she encourage you into playing the piano at a young age, or did you just was there a piano around and you took yeah. to it and then she? We, we, we we had a funky uh, old upright piano and and uh, she started me in piano lessons in, in first grade and uh, piano teachers were, were were not very good at at this time you know there was uh, you, you know they 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 were but my my older brother he's uh, four years older than me he, he was learning to play by ear he had a great uh, musical sense you know and uh, he he was showing me how to play boogie woogie and. 
<clears throat> and uh, bringing home uh, Ray Charles records. He, he had a he had a band when he was 12 years old, and so you know I would watch these guys rehearse. I mean, it was pretty uh, primitive stuff, you know, uh, boogie woogie and rock and roll. And you know, uh, we met Elvis when we were uh, when he was first starting in Memphis. So uh, that 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 kind of inspired me. I mean, see, seeing somebody reach to the top of everything. Uh, yeah, Elvis bought his first house a few doors from from my aunt and uncle in Memphis, and. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I was. Uh, my brother would show me the, the you know the left hand parts, you know, playing boogie woogie, and then uh, we would trade off on the top. So uh, uh, he was showing me a lot of you know, Jerry Lee Lewis type licks and Ray Charles licks, and you know how, how to pull them off. My, my hands were really small back then, but I was you know starting to get a feel for for everything. Uh, there, there was we were learning church music and uh, you know le- learning to play you know a lot of the hymns and stuff. So that that was you know the. That that was more and more European music, but but the the blues was all around us and, and gospel, yeah. Very cool, very yeah. cool. Yeah. And so that was I I think I read so you came down to Jackson like around fifty three, right? And around... fifty, fifty, yeah, fifty three. Um, my, my my father was working and in, in, in uh, all, all around the South, and uh, sometimes he would take us to New Orleans. And there was one particular time I'm not sure I think it was late fifties. And uh, took us to, to Preservation Hall. That was the only club you could go into uh, with, with kids at the time. And there was there was a there, there, there was a old black woman playing piano uh, and, and part of the house band. I, she was she was a featured entertainer. I, I, I and, and and recently I found out who she was. I I did some research of who, who was who was the woman piano player singer and was working in this club at the time and. And her name was uh, Sweet Emma Barrett, and yeah, I, I I found a video of her on YouTube, and and, and it all came back to me. She was a, a famous New Orleans woman piano player, and you know worked with everybody, Louis Armstrong, and she she cut a few records, and uh, and and that that was the first time I I'd seen like a blues jazz uh, piano player live. It just blew me away. She she had on she had on a red beret, and she had bells on her on her feet that you know when when she bang her feet, you know it was like a you know the but but the, the band was great, and she just uh, she was tearing it up. And, wow, uh, man, that sounds awesome. So so was do you remember a point I guess where maybe that was the point you just described, where the music just struck you I guess in a, in a way at an early age. I I don't know if there was an, an epiphany moment, but but uh, I mean just putting putting my hands on the keys and and, and playing like you know you, when you um, when you when you hit a, a root and a fifth, you know, uh, like a, a C and a G, and something about the, the vibration of those, the, the the sounds, and then everything just kind of uh, mapped out from from there. It's kind of like you know when you you you're playing baseball, you got home plate, uh, first base, second base, third base. I mean the you know when you when you hit a major triad, uh, or, you know a, a C a, a an E and a G, and you you feel the vibration of those mm-hmm. chords. It's, it's just something resonated in my brain. It was like okay, this is. This is this is the root of it all, and then yeah, I mean it's still like uh, Quincy Jones was saying those, those those same three notes or those same twelve notes. It's, uh, I mean we we've been playing these for seven hundred years. I mean absolutely. So so it was always the music that pulled you in. Sometimes it's an influence, you know. Sometimes it's like you know someone you respect or you know Dig is doing something, so you're like, okay, what is he doing? I want to check that out. Yeah, I think yeah, you have a frame of reference, and that, that was kind of mine. I would experiment with different notes and how they work together, and uh, then they you know, having a piano teacher uh, showed me some theory. Uh, that the church music, you know, had uh, you know four or five hundred years of history in it, and, and learning all these songs every Sunday kind of gave me a, a frame of reference of music theory and all that. And, you know, they get inside you and sort of become a part of you. I, I imagine after a while. Yeah, yeah, and the African influence of what was going around us. That was a whole nother thing. I mean, just on an emotional, spiritual level, um, you know, hearing black gospel music on Sunday morning and, and the blues, I mean, just, you know, the whole political, economic part of Jim Crow and all that stuff, hearing the blues, that's a whole nother part of our musical education in, in America, you know, how, how all these things came together with New Orleans and uh, and blues and jazz. It was it was evolving for, I mean, now, now it's 400 years. But New York Times is doing a history of, it's called the 1619 Project, and, and how uh, how slavery changed America, and how black culture changed everything. I mean, how we hear music, how we dance, how we you know how we play music, improvisation, everything that changed you know changed the culture of the world. But but it started here with you know, in, in the South, where, where I I grew up. Yeah, and I, I think ge- that's what I'm saying. Like geographically, uh, being between Memphis, New Orleans, 
you know, country music and Delta blues and all these different styles coalescing in one area. It's, it's you know, and particularly with those cultural shifts happening at the time. And yeah, I, I, it was, you know, a, a lot of people appreciated all that and, and they dug it, you know, but with, with the Jim Crow, it was, uh, you know, some, some parts of it were, were kind of, you know, opposed to all, all that, all that mixing. And, and it was just uh, osmosis, you know, there's, there's no way you could, you could stop this. It was just, you know, it was, it was going to, I mean, you know, it started happening with the Gershwin and Broadway and, uh, you know, the Mestre shows and all that. But I, I think Elvis was a huge part of that. I mean, he was the first one to start, you know, uh, you know, uh, crossing over. I mean, when I, when I was a kid, there were, there were, there were black stations and country stations and, and the white stations. I mean, the, uh, the big band era, it was kind of crossing over, but, uh, but it was a little more uptown than, than what, what started happening with, with Elvis and all that. I mean, I mean, New Orleans and Memphis, uh, I think th those were the, were the first places I think in, in the in the South where actually you know, you know, black and white music musicians were actually working together, you know, and and some uh, some parts of the country uh, I I read, uh, you know, it, it was it was forbidden they, they were, you couldn't have uh, blacks and whites on the same recording session, yeah, uh, and and I think New yeah New Orleans probably was probably the first place that did that and I think it was Dr. John. Who, who started, you know, who changed all that. I, I was at his funeral in, in July and they, they talked about that, you know. You, you know, I mean, unions, the unions had regulations, you know, they had to, they had to go with, with whatever, you know, it was the, you know, the, the Jim Crow laws in the day, yeah. So, so in, in, in reading a bit about your backstory, I, I know you guys had moved down to, to Jackson, but then um, I thought I had understood that you were around 13, you were, gigging around Birmingham or had you moved to Birmingham or you always lived that you grew up in Jackson for my, uh, my, my father got transferred uh, through the insurance company he got uh, we got transferred to Birmingham in 1960 and uh, we lived there until 1968 and I was uh, my, my older brother joined a band called the Ramblers and and they were very popular on the the frat house circuit and doing doing you know opening acts at some of the the big dances uh, my, my I had a friend who was a DJ in Birmingham. Uh, his name was Dave Roddy. That was his real name. And uh, and uh, this was around '64. And, and he started renting a National Guard Armory in in, in the '63, uh, '64. I mean, and he he was packing the place. He was he was maybe maybe 500 or a thousand people at at a dance. And uh, and and he had a radio show because he, he could promote the shows. And my brother's band, the Ramblers, would would open up a Open up a lot of these shows. I mean, uh, you know, they, they they would have some of the, you know, the pop stars of, of the day, and, and uh, Bobby Goldsboro and, and and Billy Joe Royal and and, and Roy Orbison, and uh, and he started bringing in. Uh, I, I think he was the first promoter to start bringing in black acts uh, from New Orleans, and that that, that was you know, one of the first times I, I got to see, uh, you know, r real real live, you know, um, New Orleans R and B. A soul, soul acts, and uh, oh, oh, it was great. And he, he he started playing a lot of New Orleans music on his radio show. That was, um, but uh, uh, let me back up. Yeah, they, uh, my brother's band features me as a as a lead singer. I was thirteen before my voice changed, and uh, so that that was when I first started performing live, just as a singer. I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't playing piano or guitar or, or sax at the time, just a singer, and they were. They would back me up, and and I did my first recording session at at, at a recording studio in Birmingham. Uh, it was it was called Boutwell Studio, and it was you know everything was just uh, two two track at the time, and uh, I, I I did one session, I had a, had a great uh, I I still remember the microphone and and the, you know the and the process. I actually had two 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 tracks, and you you could overdub uh, you, you you could you could bounce you know. Uh, from one track to the other, and and do an overdub. That's how they did overdub back back at this time. Wow. So, is that track available anywhere? Anyone could listen to it. Is it? Is, is... Uh, it's 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 actually it, uh, it's it's it sound. You know, it's, the quality is not very good. I, it was probably probably bounced a couple of times from cassettes or whatever. But uh, it, it's it's on SoundCloud. I'll, I'll send you a link. Cool, uh, cool. We'll put yeah. it in the in the description of this uh, podcast. Hey, the Ramblers. Um, I looked them up, and there was a band called the Ramblers that was inducted into the Alabama Music Hall of Fame. Was that the same band, or or no? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It was. Wow, you did your homework. That's great. Yeah, they they um, 
I think they started in 62. Uh, they still do a few gigs together. My brother doesn't play with them anymore. He's, uh, but, um, but yeah, they, they, uh, they, they, they did a couple of records that made the local charts in Alabama. And, uh, I, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Animal House, but they they would, you know, those fraternity parties where they would have a band, you know, that plays shout and all that. So they they were uh, they were like a party band, and uh, and they they you know they they were making pretty good money at the time for college guys. So, but you were fronting that band, right? Like at thirteen, like you were. You well, were... I mean, they they had their. I, I didn't do all the gigs. I would do some of the gigs where, when they were local and when they were in town, and uh, some of the bigger ones. I, I would come out and do, do maybe half an hour. I didn't do the whole the whole show. I mean, I was. I was 13 and I was just, yeah, I was doing cover, cover stuff, you know, some Ray Charles cover songs and, uh, they, they would bill me as, as Birmingham's answer to a little Stevie Wonder, which was kind of funny. I, mean, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't play harmonica at the time, but it, it was, you know, something the radio DJ came up with. It's, uh, That's cool. So, so, you know, around that time, um, I guess you were picking up influences from everywhere. I mean, that was in the mid sixties, right. And, and all kinds of, music was emerging um you know and uh cr crossing over and all all that s sort of thing so what was what were you listening to mostly during that time oh i i was a huge beatles fan when the beatles came out i just i, I learned every song and, and uh he was learning the guitar parts the bass parts uh my, my brother had a 57 precision precision bass that he sold to me uh i, I had my own band um you know, uh, started an, an, another band with, with some guys my age, and uh, and I, we, we were doing covers. We were doing, you know, the the Stones, the Beatles, uh, uh, Stax, R and B covers, uh, the Young Rascals, all that, you know, um, Blue Eyes Soul music, and um, I, I, I was learning rhythm guitar. I picked up a, a used. Uh, Fender guitar and, and uh, the bass player had to quit the band, so and um, we needed a bass player. And I said, "Well, hey, I'll I'll, I'll learn to play the bass." It was you know the, the, it was the the low first strings on on the guitar. So and, and my brother was a pretty good bass player. My other brother, I have another brother named Steve Sanders, who's a a famous newscaster in Chicago. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a link on him. He's he's a, a great guitar player. Um, he, he was the, or he's still, he's the anchorman on WGN television in Chicago. He's won six Emmy Awards and, uh, and uh, d does a lot of work in the blues uh, community in Chicago. So anyway, he sold me his 57 precision bass for 75 bucks, which is now worth maybe eight or $10,000. I, I wish I still had it, but I sold it back in the seventies for, uh, and, and bought a uh, mini Moog synthesizer. And uh, hey, that's the way, you know, who, who knew? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, the way instruments have gone up, you know, in the last 20 years, it's ridiculous. You know, I mean, I've sold a few guitars that I wish never let go. <laughs> so, oh, oh, man, yeah, we, we, we all, yeah, we had, you know, we had, a, had our arsenal of, uh, you know, Fender stuff and everything. But but anyway, uh, uh, my brother Steve was was teaching me guitar and, uh, you know, showed me the bar chords and, and, and you know, the open open course but we, we, we could never uh we, we we could never play lead like bb king or eric clapton and all that stuff it's you know uh we, we didn't have a teacher that could show us how to bend the notes and all that back then i wish man i mean i mean i, I could do it now a bit i'm not not a great guitar player but but anyway he's uh he, he would get a guitar lessons he showed me how to play bass and uh and i and i started picking it up um uh i, I was I was always thinking about the root of, uh, of of the songs and the chords, and there was all these great bass lines, you know, from 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 Duck Dunn and Stacks of Memphis, uh, you know, Paul McCartney and uh, Motown and all these things. I, I didn't I didn't know who all the players were at the time, but uh, so anyway, I, I, I started I started playing bass uh, in my young cover band. They were called the, the Odds and Ends. They they still play a little bit in Birmingham, but uh, uh, so so yeah, I, I was I was learning all these different different things and uh, um where are we uh, 19, my, in 1968 my family moved to monroe louisiana and um and uh my i i, I was learning piano uh, pl playing piano live was 
was a bitch back then because the keyboards uh, sucked unless you had a Hammond organ or you had a, a great uh, mic grand piano. Right. You know, they, you know, they had four feet of organs and all of this. And, uh, you know, we, we, we couldn't afford or, or afford to move a Hammond, Hammond organ. That's, you know, what, what I really wanted. But um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I moved to Monroe, Louisiana and uh, had a new school and all that. And, and we had a had a marching band, a pretty good jazz band at the school. And uh, and I taught my father into, uh, into buying me a tenor saxophone. And uh, he said, OK, I'll, I'll buy you a tenor saxophone if, if you'll join the marching band. You know, he was a, my father was not a music fan, but but he loved the whole the pageantry and, and the, you know, spectacle. Uh, yeah, yes, man, he loved sports and all that. And he said, OK, you know, I was I was too small to play sports. and. Uh, so, uh, so he bought me a tennis sax. I found, found a teacher, practiced all summer, made the marching band, and and joined the the, the jazz band playing tennis sax. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. This time I, I was a better bass player at at the during the time. So I, I was playing uh, electric bass in, in the in the school jazz band. I was playing t- uh, tenor saxophone in the marching band, in the concert band. Um, but but the the, the saxophone. Uh, now, now that that was an epiphany. The, 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 I went to an assembly at the school, and, and the jazz band was, was playing their spring concert. I was, I think, I was sixteen uh, at the time. I, I can't remember what they were playing. It was probably a, like a Count Basie, Woody Herman, Buddy Rich kind of, you know, the five saxophone section scored, you know. And, um, and and that 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 was the day I said, "Oh my man, this is." I, I had a vision of myself. I, I know it sounds crazy, but. Uh, had a vision. I, I was playing uh, lead tenor saxophone at some concert somewhere, and there was you know thousands of people out there, and uh, I, I I could actually feel the feel my fingers on the keys. It was just some kind of a it was a vision. It was, it, it was like something from uh, the Blues Brother movie. Wow, wow. a sign from God. Yeah. Mission from God. That's that's <laughs> awesome. So was that before your dad had bought you the sax, or that? No, was... no, no. That that was the actual day, and I I came in. He came home early. I think. Uh, he came home at maybe four o'clock, and I said, "You know, I gotta have a saxophone. This is something, <laughs> uh, something I gotta do." I it was just, you know. Anyway, and we had an old uh, cornet trumpet uh, in a closet collecting dust, and he he took it down to a music store, and he says, "How much you give me on a trade in for for a saxophone?" And uh, worked out a deal. I think it was like four hundred bucks, and uh, bought me a brand new Contenor saxophone. It was a student model, but it was, you know, hey, the th- the thing looked like it had a thousand keys on it. I said, "How how much?" Yeah, but anyway, now that that's that's how that came did, about. Did did you start learning yourself, or you started taking lessons, or? How, how I, you... I I I found a teacher, uh, a band director at one of the schools, and uh, and and he started me off uh, private lessons. Uh, I can't remember his name. It was not a great teacher, but but he he got me the basics of you know uh, learning the scales and all that and getting a t- uh, a decent tone. And um, yeah, I, I kind of. Uh, I, I went to band camp that summer and uh, started practicing every day. My, my mother would send me out to the to a storage room. She said, "I, I don't want to hear any other squeaks," you know. So I'd, I'd go out there for three or four hours a day and 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 and, and learn the saxophone. Yeah. So you were in Birmingham, and and at that time you were playing, you know, in your own cover band. So you kind of had some things in motion. And then when you moved to to Monroe, you were sort of at the end of high school, I guess, uh, or is that? About right. I was I was sixteen. I just I was just starting my my junior year. Uh, no, uh, yeah, junior yeah, eleventh grade. <clears throat> did you immediately start up a new project or band or anything like that, or were you? I I, I didn't know a soul in in, in the town. I mean, I I met some people. There were there were uh, there there were some great great musicians from there. Uh, but but I, I I didn't know a soul. I mean, I was just trying to get acclimated and 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 getting into the whole. Culture. It, it, it was kind of rough, you know. Sure, moving and transitioning and all that stuff. But then moving forward, you you um, studied both, you know, got degrees, I think, in both jazz and classical music. In uh, is that correct? Like after that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I um, after I graduated from high school, uh, um, I, I started uh, on, on my 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 senior year. I I started a band with it was, it was a uh, a horn band, you know, uh, you know, playing on weekends and and jam sessions and and where we could work. Uh, 
Uh, and, and we were doing Chicago and Blood, Sweat and Tears uh, covers. And that, that's where I learned to write uh, horn parts. I, it, you, know, you couldn't buy those. You know, there was no nothing online. You know, And uh, so, so I, I learned to transcribe the horn parts from from those Blood, Sweat and Tears and, 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 and Chicago and, and uh, you know, everyone is white trash horn parts and all that. And, and, and that's kind of where I learned to. The arrangement, yeah, it was it was only four horns, but it was it, it was a start. I mean, if you if, if you could write for four, you could write for you know, for a big band. Absolutely, just breaking apart the existing arrangements probably led to that. It's real helpful, right? In terms of yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chicago had I think four horns, and I think Blood, Sweat, and Tears had four or five horns, and uh, and, and 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 I and I wrote them out, and it was you know, uh, oh, oh, it was great, and uh, we 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 were one of the only you know, pop uh, horn bands around you know, North Louisiana. So um, there was a, a, a friend of mine, uh, there was a guy named Ferris Corder, strange name, but um, he was uh, the secretary of the union and he booked all of the, you know, when all the, all the pickup bands would come in town, uh, he, he booked all the big society orchestras and all that. And uh, he had a 12 piece uh, society band. Uh, you know, with with uh, how many horns he had? Yeah, probably yeah, twelve piece rhythm section and and however many horns that is. Uh, you know, three uh, three tr- trumpets, two two trombones, and three or four saxes, and uh, and he um, he started hiring me to write write the arrangements for for his society band, oh, that's and cool. uh, and they they would play you know they would play debutante balls you know the big society. Um, Events where, where the you know when a girl turns eighteen she has a big uh, uh, and, and all the all the rich girls from from the from the society families they, they would they would have a big uh, ball at the country club and and they, they would have an orchestra there and and, and uh, so we play things like that we we play the uh, the the beauty pageants so and so I, I started arranging for that and pit, pit orchestras and things. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, yeah, that that was when, when I started becoming an arranger. I, I took arranger class in the school and orchestration, and uh, that was round about your senior year in in high school. Uh, no, that was I was actually I, I started in uh, I started college in 1970 at the University of North Louisiana, and uh, that's uh, uh, majored in music, uh, composition, saxophone, learned to play the flute, uh, saxophone, clarinet, uh, studying classical piano, and. Uh, and I'm and playing in the jazz band, and uh, yeah, I, I I was there for two years. Um, and uh, uh, 1970, I think it was 70, 1972, I, I transferred to uh, the Univers- University of North Texas, and and, and they had you know, a great university, and I, I was that that was in you know 19, from 72 to 74. Uh, that was. Right at, at uh, around the end of the Vietnam War, and and, and I was um, I, I kind of wanted to want to uh, quit school and go uh, join a band, go on the road, and uh, but Vietnam was going on, and, and you had to stay in school to uh, stay out of the war. Uh, if, if you wanted, you, uh, it was it was called a two S deferment. If if you were a full time student, you could uh, you could stay out of out of uh, the military. What made you switch from the school in? Monroe, where you were, to uh, to the to the school in in Denton. A uh, uh, good question. I, I was I, w- I was in the school in, in, in North Louisiana. It, it was a pretty good school, not a great school. It was it was more of a music uh, program to, for for band directors and, and music teachers. Uh, not not a lot of pro- professional musicians uh, came out of that that uh, program. And I and I had a sax teacher, good good sax teacher, but. Uh, he said, "You know, uh, my, um, you know, if, if if you really want to be serious about being a professional musician, you you, you might think about uh, transferring to to another school." Uh, he uh, said, "This is a great one." And and a friend of mine brought in uh, an an album that the uh, the North Texas uh, big band lab band had done, and uh, and it, it it was amazing. I mean, it was world class. It sounded like a professional. Big band out of L.A. or New York. I mean, they had uh, the the lead tenor player was Blue Lou Marini from the Blues Brothers. Oh yeah. Uh, he, he he was he was uh, and he was going to school at that time. That was uh, and um, 
a few other people who, who had gone on to be, uh, you know, some of the top session players in, in America. Dean Parks was the guitar player. Uh, uh, Dean Parks is, you know, the top uh, guitar session player in L.A. Uh, Dave, Dave Hunke was, was a bass player. He's uh, one of the top Nashville session guys. You think if the war wasn't happening, you might not have gone in that direction of the, you know, school direction? You might have just done your own thing musically and I, I, i'm not sure it's, it's it's hard to say what you would have done my, my, my father was very uh very big on on education he, he wanted us all all the, the all we have four siblings in my family he wanted us all to to, to finish college uh, he uh, he had a master's degree uh he's very 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 smart and he, you know, that was he probably would have uh, kept pushing it you know i was just curious if you saw it as a real important part of you know becoming a professional musician, or, or was it a combination of factors that was like, yeah, this uh, yeah. I, I I think it was a con combination. Yeah. I mean, I mean, look, looking back, I'm, I'm glad I did. I, I learned so much, but I I think um, um, they, they encouraged me to get get the whole academic program, and and it, it, in a at university you have to take so many academic courses, I and mean, you have to take English, mathematics, science, history, uh, English literature. Uh, uh, so so many things that that you probably won't use in, in your profession, but uh, you know to get to get a, a a bachelor's degree you have to take all those things for sure. the a academic part and and my my ac ac academic courses were taking more time than the, the mu music courses. I mean just just learning the piano alone. I mean that would take four or five hours a day. I mean you, to 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 pass the graduation exam for for any, any music student there you had to. You had to learn about Beethoven Sonata, Bach Convention. You had to know all your major and minor skills, and, and that's just for a, just for uh, for any any music student, not to, not just piano major. So, just curious, as your life has sort of unfolded, what is the relationship you have with practice and and study, and you know, has it obviously at that period you were forced to to do it, and how does it how has it evolved for you over the years that? Practicing, studying, learning, that sort of stuff. Well, when, when I was uh, when I when I quit school, I, I quit for two years. I, I dropped out in in 1974 and, and joined a funk band out of Dallas um, called Buster Brown. And, and we were playing five, six nights a week. And and I, at, at that time, uh, you know, the, the the gigs were booked. We had a manager. Uh, I could spend four or five hours a day uh, practicing saxophone or piano, and uh, I had a turntable. And I would slow it down to uh, uh, what thirty-three or what sixteen. You, you could slow the turntables down, and 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 I would write out the solos from from some of the jazz guys and all that, and and and, and then we, we had a great house gig, and I, I could try out the, the solos at night. Oh, oh, let's do uh, uh, whatever, blah blah blah, by, by Miles Davis, you know. And uh, you know, I, I could try out the solos that I was learning from John Coltrane, or, or but uh, I, I think now, now I don't have have enough time to practice. I, I wish I did. Uh, but yeah, I, I think uh, if, if you have the time, I mean, uh, while people are still young, you know, and, and their their teens or twenties or whatever, I mean, if if you can, if people can can afford to do it, I mean, uh, spend four or five hours a day. You mentioned a few. Who were some of the you know the saxophone players that really lit you up. When I was still in in, in Louisiana and in, in Monroe, Louisiana, uh, I, I was too young to get in the clubs. But there was a, and I didn't have any records by this guy. But I'd, I'd heard about a guy named John Smith, uh, who who was in a band called the Boogie Kings, and um, and they, they 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 were kind of swamp pop R and B. Uh, yeah, you 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 can find uh, you can find some of his stuff online. I think uh, John John Smith with no H J O N. And um, uh, he and Edgar Winter started a band called White Trash, and and he, uh, in, in my for my ears, he was he was the baddest soul blues tenor player in in the South. Um, just just amazing, but he could play the standards too. He was from South Louisiana, around Lafayette. Um, but I, I listened to uh, I, I moved to Dallas, and there was a guy from Dallas named David Fathead Newman. Uh, who, who was a big influence on me and I ended up getting to work with him at uh, one of the clubs in Dallas when he would come from New York. 
Uh, he, he played most of the the tenor solos on the, on the Atlantic uh, blues and soul jazz recordings at this time for Atlantic. Uh, Aretha Franklin and so, so many other ones. Uh, he was a big influence on me. Uh, the, uh, the Texas tenor players uh, got him, Wilton Felder, Felder from the Crusaders. It's called Texas tenor. It had a just had this re- really big. It was kind of a cross crossover from blues and jazz. King Curtis at all? King Curtis. King Curtis. Yeah. Um, David Fathead Newman. Uh, let's see who else. Um, who was the guy I mentioned? Uh, uh, Wilton Felder from the Crusaders. There was another guy from uh, Ray Charles' band. Yeah. They, they, these guys. Uh, they were kind of the crossover from blues and jazz. I mean, they, they could still burn on the blues and, and just play bebop and all that stuff. And they were much more soulful. And, and, and if you listen to a lot of the smooth jazz guys like Dave Coz and, and Huge, Huge Groove and uh, uh, David Sanborn, all the, they, they were all influenced by those same same people. But uh, they, they, they were my main influences on, on tenor. And, and, yeah, and smooth jazz, I, I, I worked for a company uh, called... Uh, smoothjazzbackingtracks.com and I, and I do uh, I, I do some of the backing tracks um, of, of those guys and you, you can download the backing tracks from that website it's called smooth, smoothjazzbackingtracks.com <clears throat> and um, I, I, I do the backing tracks in my studio and, and, and write out the solos uh, it's, it's one of my it's, I call it my day job but uh, you know it's, it's kind of like karaoke for, for horn players and uh and, and it's actually uh, uh, very, very close recreations of the original tracks, but with, without the solo instrument. Cool. So when you're studying, say, a style like bebop and jazz and stuff like that, but then you're turned sort of into the crossover guys, you know, do, how do you, you're just learning everything at, at once or you're, you're, you're just trying to absorb it all? It's sort of hard, you know, sometimes, you know, for guitar, uh, just from my own experience, you know, like when you're learning a style or you're trying to cop a style authentically, you know, it, it's sort of hard to synthesize it sometimes. It takes a lot of work to get it right. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think, um, you, you know, I mean, growing up around the blues and all that, it's 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 kind of a, you know, hearing those players, I mean, it, it just seemed uh, kind of natural to me. Um, I, I think the first. We we didn't have a lot of jazz records growing up where I was. I mean, there was you go to the record store and there was only maybe three or four jazz records in, in the in the bin. I was, we lived in a small town, you know. But uh, my 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 parents only had a few few jazz records. I think they had uh, Getz Gilberto with Stan Getz and uh, Joao G- G- Gilberto, it was, which was amazing, you know. And I, t- I tried to get as much jazz records records as I could, but the uh, when I moved to Texas and uh, I, we started playing around Dallas, I mean, the, it was very, um, you know, the clubs were, were very uh, uh, segregated this time. You know, the, the, you know, the white clubs wanted uh, ZZ Top and uh, Popman Turner Overdrive, and, and, and they wanted rock and roll. And uh, and, and the band, I had a band called Buster Brown. They they were very very black, uh, all, all white guys from. from the Texas Panhandle, but uh, you know we were playing Herbie Hancock and Stevie Wonder and uh, soul blues and jazz and the uh, and the uh, we kept getting fired from the white clubs. You know they wanted to hear all you know. Uh, and, and we we played we played some you know, we played Jimi Hendrix and all of that and a lot of you know, a lot of great stuff. But they, they you know they wanted to, and um, we had two two keyboard players. The the the, the other keyboard player, k- killer singer, it sounded like Donny Hathaway. And um, and and he played great Fender Rose. He had a Hammond organ, and I, I was another keyboard player, but I was playing more uh, more, more sax and, and lead vocals. And uh, anyway, so we, we 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 started playing the black clubs, and, and and so that that style of tenor saxophone I played, it was you know they wanted to hear more uh, more more of the crossover, you know, uh, you, know you know funky. Or average white band, and and you know that 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 style I was telling you about, you know, with the, you know, so yeah, I mean, uh, I I didn't get to play as much be- bebop in those those times. They wanted to hear more and more of the, you know, you know, soulful King Curtis type uh, tenor, you know, yeah. That's cool. And then on from there, you headed out to San Francisco for for a little bit. Is that right? You. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I. Uh, played in this band for a while, and then I joined um, an all-black funk band uh, with, with some great, great players. And 
plays r- r- really rough uh, clubs at this time. You know, there's a lot of. Uh, what were you uh, learning at that time? Like, what were what were some of the big lessons you were learning, musical or otherwise? What was what was going on? Uh, um, uh, you know, um, mm, gosh, yeah, some 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 hard lessons. You know, that was, you, you know, to uh, to play in those clubs of those days. I mean, that was, uh, you know, there was there was gun violence, there were drugs, uh, prostitution, all that. Uh, you know, I, I think. Uh, I, I'm thinking um, maybe I need to practice a little more and get get some 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 better gigs. I mean, I love the people I was working with. They were, they were great mu- musicians, but you know, I mean, I mean, th- this was a it's, it's a rough life, you know. So that's that's the way you saw it at the time, like cause, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. There were there was you know, I mean, some of the guys in the band were, were you know, uh, you know, there there was uh, there were there were drugs you know in this time. I mean, uh. uh you know, I, I don't want to mention any names, but they are, they're all clean now. But but uh, but they they went through some 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 hard stuff. So yeah, it's and you never got you never got caught up in, in or you were able to steer clear of that. Yeah, yeah, I I I didn't want to see what happened to my my friends. You know, you know, a few things happened that uh, I I went back to Louisiana and finished my degree uh, in one semester. My 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 dad uh, kind of made, made me a deal, and uh, you know, I, I thought it was a good you know, a good time to get away. You know, from that whole scene, you know, I, I, you know, there there were some great music. You know, I got to work with Freddie King and uh, you know a lot of great Dallas musicians. Fre- Freddie was one one of the one one of the best. But um, he uh, he he asked me to go on the room with him uh, right before he died, and uh, uh, he he died in 1976. Um, anyway, I, I moved back to Louisiana, uh, Monroe, Louisiana. Got my degree, uh, and w- w- which was you know, a, a great thing. Um, there, there was a band in Dallas, Texas called Uncle Rainbow. Great, great band. Uh, they were um, mostly all original, but they played uh, Steely Dan, Herbie Hancock, Stevie Wonder, uh, Doobie Brothers. But uh, it was about 80 percent original, and they, they asked me to join the band. And uh, so I moved back to Texas. Uh, we we met a met the drummer of the Doobie Brothers, who was married to my lead singer's uh, cousin and um, came came and heard the band in, in Vail, Colorado and uh, signed us to a production deal uh, and, and he had just left the Doobie Brothers, had a lot of money and uh, had a studio in Los Angeles called uh, Chateau and um, he said I- I'm, I'm going to make you guys stars yeah, going to move you to Northern California, I'll, I'll pay your salary uh, and, and we'll do a production deal and get, try to get you guys uh, a record deal, so I so I moved to California in 1977, and into uh, Northern California, and into uh, I moved to around San Jose, uh, Los Gatos, you know, around the South Bay. So just just rewinding, so like you were you were you were in Dallas area, and you you were playing, and it was getting a little hairy for you, I guess. And you had you at that point you had kind of uh, been out of school for two years at that at that point. Um, uh, I, yeah, yeah, I, w- I was in that band, Buster Brown, and we we had some. Uh, uh, we had some personal uh, differences, and uh, so I, I I lost that gig and, and got got uh, picked up by this all black uh, soul funk band, uh, the baddest uh, funk bass player and I'd, I'd ever heard. He sounded like Larry Graham. He was great. Uh, the the lead singer uh, he was they they were uh, background singers for Leon Russell and and great great songwriters. All of this they they were the top uh, black musicians in Dallas, I think. Uh, they had a, a female vocalist who went on to be a background vocalist for John Mellencamp, and the the, the two lead, lead singers went on to tour with with Leon Russell as background singers. They were part of the whole uh, blues, jazz, gospel, soul, funk scene in Dallas. The, the guitar player was uh, smoking Joe Kubek. I don't know if you know him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, dr- the drummer was um, Alan Bones Perry. We call him Bones Jones. He was a former drummer of James Brown. Uh, Sounds like a funky group. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. But you know, it's, it was a rough gig. It was. A, <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So you you were yeah. you were kind of feeling a r- little rough around the edges. You went back and finished up school, and then you got the gig with um, Uncle Rainbow, right? That, uh, that... Uh, uh, Uncle Rainbow. They they were uh, they, they were they were one of the top bands in Dallas. They were two 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 or three uh, of the. Uh, the great bands, and and they had a, a killer lead singer named Richard Oates, who was, uh, you know, went went on to, to win some of those uh, TV 
vocal talent shows. I can't remember, but um, but yeah, he, he had a, he had a killer range. I mean, he's, he's uh, you know he's he's like one of those powerhouse lead vocals like Mickey Thomas or uh, the lead singer from Toto. I mean, he was you know good good looking and and all that. To, uh, but the, you know the band was great. We were doing uh, about half originals and half covers like Steely Dan and. Uh, were you playing sax in the band or were you playing keys? And- I, I was playing keys and sax. We had two uh, an, another great great keyboard player, uh, a guy named Brent Bourgeois, who went on to form Bourgeois Tag, uh, one of the uh, one of the great bands out of the '80s. Uh, Bourgeois Tag had a hit song with uh, called "I Don't Mind at All," and uh, but they. Um, they were all great, great musicians, great writers. We had, had a drummer named uh, 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 George Lawrence, who also came out of North Texas. He was uh, he went on to be a great uh, studio musician in in in, in Los Angeles. Uh, but they they were all all the monster players, and um, we we uh, we were playing a gig in um, in Vail, Colorado, a two week run up there, um, and. Uh, the drummer uh, from the Doobie Brothers, a guy named Michael Hossack, uh, came up to hear us and uh, and made a handshake deal to move us to California. This was in the summer of 1977. And um, he said, I, I want to I do this. You know, I, I've got a killer studio in Los Angeles. He, he had a lot of money uh, from the Doobies. But, but he had left the Doobie Brothers, and he wanted to start uh, producing acts and, and – uh, he he had a studio called Chateau Recorders in in Hollywood. Uh, no, actually it was Burbank. Uh, so anyway, we uh, he he signed a, a deal and we 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 all moved with, with girlfriends, wives, uh, roadies, groupies, the whole thing. Moved to California. Well, as part of that deal, you had some money to get by month to month. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. He he paid us a salary every week and he paid my rent for about six months. And, and and the whole band H- had a great place and, and place called Los Gatos, California. Great uh, scene in California was great. Oh man, it was lot live music everywhere. This is before uh, cable television and internet and all that. And and it, everywhere we went, the, you know, the clubs were packed. And um, were you guys playing a lot when you first got there? He had a huge house in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and uh, so we we rehearsed there every, every day for about uh, three months. He wanted to tighten the band up. He wanted to. Uh, Picks with, with songs we wanted to record, and so we, we didn't we didn't play a gig for the first two or three months we were out there, and and um, it, it it was a little t- uh, over rehearsed I thought, but um, but he uh, he, he had a, he had a concept in mind what he wanted to do, and and uh, we we started playing around, and we were uh, doing all all 100 percent originals, maybe maybe was co- uh, maybe one or two covers, and. Uh, and, and before you even played the gig, uh, the first gig, there, there was already a buzz in, in, in the in the Bay Area. So we uh, we came did did our first gig. It was packed, and and they had a they had a hippie named uh, Captain Wizzo, and he, he had one of the psychedelic light shows behind us, you know, like in the Fillmore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. Half of, half of the crowd was musicians. They wanted to hear this about this band who just came out from Texas and blew everybody away, and. Um, we we started recording and we did just started doing demos down his studio in L.A. Uh, uh, and and a fun, funny story around this time we were we were we were a month in, in Hollywood uh, staying at, at a funky motel and and uh, we, we were in the studio maybe four days a week uh, and and I'd heard about this show uh, that had just started called the Gong Show and it was it was in, in Burbank and and I have a, I have a, a crazy unusual talent called called hand farts. Um, and um multi yeah. multi-faceted yeah. sweet <laughs> so i went uh I, I i called them up i said well, uh where do i audition they said we'll come down to this little uh office building in, in in downtown hollywood and uh came down there and it was just a uh, a man in the room with, with a with a camcorder and uh and uh so I did my thing. I I, I played uh, Sweet Georgia Brown on hand farts, and then I played sax- saxophone. <laughs> and, uh, and and uh, did you get gonged? Well, well, yeah, yeah. well that, that was. Uh, it had to go back for a session audition. There, it was Chuck Barris and, and the musical director, a guy named uh-huh. Mil- Mil- Milton De- Delug, Delug or Delug. I forget how you pronounce his name. It, anyway, I, I found out later he was uh, he had written a lot of uh, 
famous uh, jazz standards, and and uh, you know, uh, he was the the, M, the director of the NBC orchestra at one time in the in the I think in the fifties or the sixties. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, went, I, I did the show. No, I won. I won the first prize. I won. Uh, uh, they they wrote an, an arrangement, a really cool arrangement, and uh, I, I think that they uh, they give you ninety seconds, and and if you uh, you you get thirty seconds, and if you, if you don't get gonged in the, in the uh, you, you have to you have to play for thirty seconds, and then you know you do your whole act, you know. But uh, they they have to let you do the first second, just for thirty seconds before they gong you. But uh, anyway, I won. Yeah. Nice. And nice. Uh, it, it, it it was on YouTube for a while, but uh, YouTube pulled it uh, for copyright uh, violations. Uh, yeah, you can find it on Facebook. I'll, I'll send you a link. Yeah, please do. That'd be hilarious. So, were you just playing with with the one band? Yeah, uh, yeah, there? yeah. And this in in those days, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, nowadays I, I do pick up uh, thankful for whoever, but. Uh, yeah, we we uh, I mean there were there were no subs at this time. We had a falling out with with uh, the Doobie Brothers drummer and and, and uh, so we just we just started working in the in the clubs. Uh, band was tight and uh, the club owners wanted wanted a little more cover music. So we had to learn the uh, you know the pop dance hits of, of the day. Uh, but um, yeah, we were working six nights a week from Monterey to San Francisco to to Marin County. Uh, one one of the uh, the the DJs or a uh, guy doing the, the the board mix from the front of house made made a cassette tape of one of one of our sets and sent it to a producer named Ian Samwell. He he produced uh, America and Cliff Richard from England. He was an English producer and uh, he uh, loved the band. And then he sent it to another producer named Jimmy Horowitz, who was. Uh, Vice president of Reva Records. It was Rod Stewart's label, and uh, they ended up signing us to a record deal and uh, had a eighty thousand dollar budget, which was big at the time. I mean, still big, man. And uh, so we we finished the album, and uh, and then it went to the hands of the lawyers, and it was three or four or four months of negotiations. At the, the lawyers totally screwed up the deal, and uh, we, we ended up get, getting getting shelved. We couldn't sign up to another label because they were, you know, it was. But yeah. you guys, you guys, yeah, track the album. We, we, yeah, we did the album. It, 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 it was great. I think it was a little overproduced. Uh, you know, look, look, looking back on it, I mean, great, great, great band. Uh, I, I think I think it was a little too slick for my taste. But uh, it, it was, uh, this was ni- 1979. Uh, 19, it was, you know, before New, A- New Wave and the, uh, before MTV and all this and, and the, the the record companies at the time they you know they were looking for the next big thing I mean they, they didn't know what it was it was it was kind of the end of disco and uh, uh, you know, the, the the biggest album at at that time had been Saturday Night Fever and then uh, but we we were kind of more we were we were kind of, uh, kind, of kind of a pop fusion band you know pop pop soul R and B uh, uh, singer songwriter and um, we, we kind of fell through the cracks, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So then that kind of led to the end of that. that yeah. Uh, yeah. Or... yeah we, well, well, we signed with Darnell Michael Walden. Uh, you, you know him, uh, uh, producer. I don't. Uh, his name is Narada Michael Walden. Uh, he he was a great jazz fusion drummer. Played with Mahavishnu Orchestra and uh, and then he played with the Jeff Beck group. And then he uh, he moved to San Francisco and. Uh, he, he was just so so driven. One, one of the best drummers in the world. Anyway, he uh, he started producing um, R and B acts. He had a few hits on the R and B charts, and then he, he signed us to a production deal. I, I spent maybe six months with him, arranging, co-writing. Uh, I, I learned a lot from this guy. He's he's amazing. But uh, he was a disciple of uh, Sri Chimnoy, you know, the the guru from Carlos Santana. Yeah. He was he was into Eastern religion. He brought up a, a, a few people to audition the band for a record deal. Brought up a guy named John Kalagna who signed Foreigner and a lot, lot of big name acts. And uh, uh, anyway, we did, we couldn't get a record deal, and, and the band broke up. Um, you said they had put you on the shelf, like the eighty thousand dollars. You tracked the album, and and then th- that after that ended, you you hooked up with this drummer, and that was a separate situation with the same band, or that's all part of the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, that was with the same band, Uncle Rainbow, and. Uh, he he wanted to uh he had, yeah he was a master in the studio just uh great i mean if something wasn't totally locked into the click i mean he was just you know i i learned a lot about production with him but he was he was very slick uh production also i mean he wanted uh, uh total perfection 
you learned a lot. I'm curious what what did you take? What were some of the well, big well, takeaways? Well, uh, yeah, I, I was the main songwriter in the band. I, I would go to his house and and he, he would just pick everything apart and trying trying to get to the hook. I mean, he was he wanted to he wanted to get pop hits. He he wanted to uh, he he was trying to find a, a white blue eyed soul band who could who, who could get on top of the charts. And uh, he thought we'd be the guy to do it. We had the great singer. We had the you know. He thought my 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 tunes were good. I I, I thought it was, I'm a better writer now, but uh, but but he was he was helping me try kind of you know get get the songs a little more polished and and ready for radio. So that that's what I took away from that. Uh, laying down the grooves in the studio. He, uh, he was he was not happy with the rhythm section, and he wanted to bring in Randy Jackson, who was one of the judges on American Idol. Randy was the top session bass player in San Francisco at that time. Went on to play with Journey. But uh, and uh, and and he wanted to play drums on the on the CD, which which uh, caused a riff in the band, and uh, and so we 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 lost uh, uh, two of the main guys. We lost a bass player, and we lost our uh, other keyboard player, writer Brent Bourgeois, who, and, and they, they went on to form a band called Bourgeois Tag. So anyway, that, the band broke up because of that, um, which was sad. Sad, great, 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 great band. Yeah. Do do you kind of? Credit him with with the breakup. In a uh, way, or, or yeah, yeah. I, I was kind of on the fence, you know. I, you know, we. Uh, yeah. I, I want, you know, I, I, I was, you know, in, in retrospect, I, I'm a little sorry I, I didn't stick to my guns and and uh, said no. We, we we've got a band, we got a sound, we got to, this is the the energy. Yeah, you know, that we, we we try to make it work. You know. Um, sure, it's it's hard. It's hard to know. You know, it's infinite. What you can, which direction you can go, and how. Uh, you know, a different vision for production can throw a song, yeah. you know, from one direction to a completely different other direction and lose the spirit. Yeah. I mean, now that you know, be, being a solo performer, I mean, I'll, I'll bring in a different bass player for this song, and I think, oh, so I'll, or this guitar player would, would work better on this song, or whatever. I mean, it's just uh, you know, you're you're casting. It's like you're casting a movie, whatever. But um, but anyway, to, on, on a side note, just this guy, Nader Michael Walden, a couple of years a after that, he he became a staff producer at, uh, I think, Arista. And um, he got, to, I, I think his first big break as a, as a producer was, was Aretha Franklin. And, and he produced um, uh, Free, Freeway of Love with, with Aretha. He, he wrote the song and, uh, and produced it, uh, uh, which was Aretha's uh, huge comeback. She hadn't had a hit, you know, in about... Ten years, and, and that just put her on top of the charts. You know, he, he brought in Clarence Clemens to play the sax solo, and uh, uh, they, they they brought in Whitney Houston. I remember that. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Free, Freeway of Love, and then uh, right right after that, he got the deal to pr produce Whitney, and that just uh, he, he won Producer of the Year with, with her uh, at the Grammys, and uh, Album of the Year, and all that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I was I was kind of disappointed we we didn't continue working together, but we're. Um, we we still uh, we're still in contact and uh, yeah he's he's done great yeah cool how 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 has your songwriting evolved since then you said you know you were you've gotten better <laughs> how has it evolved yeah you know uh, well, I I, f I found a great uh, co-writer on, on on a lot of my stuff I I worked with Paul Williams for um almost thirty years uh, Paul was was probably the biggest songwriter of the seventies and uh, uh, and uh, um. But uh, uh, Paul's music director was a guy named Chris Caswell, and we we wrote a lot of stuff together. We did some television stuff. I wrote some some things for The Bold and the Beautiful. I got a Emmy nomination for that. Uh, for for us, it ne never was a hit, but it but it got uh, it got on the show and got uh, got me some some credits. Nice. Uh, uh, got, um, in 2004, I, I wrote um, uh, a song called "Foreclose on the House of Love," which made it. To, to number nine on the blues charts and got a, a nomination for blues song of the year at the blues awards. And, um, the, uh, that, that one, just, I, I just wrote really quick. I just, I got a, an idea in my head. I think, um, so, songwriting is, is I, I think, uh, I don't know if it's, 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 it's evolved. I mean, I mean, the, for, for, for me, I, I, my, my, the melody is a strong point for me. My, 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 my strongest, uh, gift i think uh, lyrics are a little little more more difficult difficult to come by but um sometimes a, a melody will just come to me in my head there's a song on my, on my new cd called joy in the morning I, I wrote for my wife and uh 
the, the, the melody came to me in a dream. And it's a da 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 You can check it out in the new CD, but... Uh, Tweaking but, some twang, right? That's a new CD? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, that song is, is totally uh, different from any, anything else on the CD, but I, but it's, I wanted to put it on there. Um, but, but yeah, but the... the my, my one of my composition teachers and in, in the university, he, he said, you know, the best melodies will come to you with, when you're not uh, writing at a keyboard or, or guitar. Just so uh, you know, if, if it just if, if it comes to you in your in your head, it's you know when you when you sit down on the piano, you, you, your your fingers will kind of go to familiar patterns that, and, and and sometimes you know when you're just walking down the street, a melody will come to you, or you'll whistle something, or I'm in the shower. Uh, uh, for me, though, those are the most uh, memorable catches melodies to me what are some of the things that you've learned not to do when you approach songwriting or are there any oh let's see i try to avoid uh, uh cliches and the lyrics and, and some, something that's that you know that people hadn't thought of i mean with country music it's you know, it's a lot of wordplay type stuff uh do you write through the filter of a style or do, like just a melody comes to you and you it, it, it depends on what I'm writing. Um, uh, when, uh, when I'm working with, with another lyricist, uh, when they send me a lyric, I, I like to get get the the words first. I think that that's the way a lot of people work. That's the way how David and Backrack work and, and uh, Elton John, uh, Bernie Taupin. Um, if it's a great lyricist, uh, I, I, I try to find the meter of the lyrics. You know, you know, something will come to me with uh, the the meter, and, and then then I get a tempo. If, if if the melody comes first, that's that's a whole whole another ball of wax. Uh, you know, everybody writes different, but but for, but for me, I think uh, it, it depends on what I'm writing. If it's uh, if, if it's R R and B soul blues, uh, it, I, I think of a groove. You know, I, I try to groove, uh, get a groove in my head and get a form, and then uh, the title comes first. Uh, I, I try to get a storyline in my head, like like the, uh, the the song "Foreclosed in the House of Love," the, which I saw the story in my head. It was uh, I was buying a house in California and. And, and a friend of mine said, oh, well, well, if you go to the courthouse about once a month and, and, and they, they do these foreclosures, you know, and I was trying to think what happened to the, uh, the family who lost the home and all that. It was and a blues song came out of it. You know, it was, it was a guy working three jobs and and the, the partner of the spouse was, uh, you know, not contributing so much. And he's he's trying to hold it all together. And she's, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of a. Uh, you know. I think it's endlessly interesting how how songs come to people and how they tease them out because you know some people are very formulated about how they approach songwriting they, they work at it and some people ideas come they come when they come so to speak you know it's uh, i mean every everyone is different i mean to me i i you know, I, I talked to paul williams you know how he approaches things i mean there, there was there was there was one song he wrote called waking up alone and, and it sounds like oh my god it just ripped your heart out i think oh my god this is was a tragic uh Tragic love affair, or whatever, and you know, I said, wow, well, what what's the backstory in this? He said, oh, I just came up with the title, I had the story in my head, and then I just kind of, uh, I worked backwards, you know. Uh, okay, this this is what happened, but 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 you know, th that one uh, foreclosed on the house of love. You're trying so hard to make this work and, and make ends meet and all that, and finally, uh, you know, you know, they put the the bank notice on the house. Nothing more I can do, you know, if uh, you can't make this work, you know, but. Um, on the new album, Tweak, Tweaking Some Twang, I was trying to write a, a crossover blues country uh, fusion record, and and that that was the title track, and I, and I knew it was. And uh, Twang is, you know, there's Twang is and a lot of different kind of music, uh, country, and 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 you know, you listen to Albert Albert Collins, he's got a huge Twang on his guitar. Yeah. So with that album, in some sense, you had a vision for a so, sort of sound. That's where yeah, it's yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm a, I listened to a bit of country music when I, when I was a kid. In those days, there was only uh, Black stations, country stations, and and the smooth station with Frank Sinatra and all that, you know. And so we we keep squishing back and forth. And I, was, you know, I I I love the way those you know those guitar players could do that chicken picking thing and all that. And it, it was kind of bluesy country, and uh, those two two genres are, are so close together, blues and country, but uh, they're miles apart. You know, uh, there's a lot of polarization in this time. You know, I think there always was, but not now a little bit more. You know, I I, I don't think that album's going to bring it all together, but but it was it was kind of a Hopeful, I, you know. I mean, I mean, country is one of the biggest genres in America, you know, and, and in Canada, and, and Canada, it, it, it's it's huge. And when I hear these guys play, I mean, I got Brent Mason on this album. He's he's playing the solo. I mean, he's I mean, he, he can play anything, but he's he's the top session guy in Nashville. And and I got a 
a uh, great steel guitar player playing the other solo on that. And uh, he's the top steel guitar player, Bruce Kaplan. He's from California. Played with David Byrne and Chris Isaac, the Black Crows, uh, Jewel, um, Cheryl Crow. He, uh, he's, but, you know, so I, I kind of combined all these different uh, sounds in my head. And that's, you know, tweaking means you're, you're going to adjust something to your life. Yeah, man, it's a great album. I mean, I've listened to it a few times and, and, and it's got, you know, uh, anyone check it out. It's on John's site, uh, johnleesanders.com. We'll put a link to it too. But, um, you know, it's got this seamless blend of gospel, funk, you know, uh, soul, uh, country, and blues. So is that with that rock and roll, some boogie woogie rock and roll? Would you say that's? Uh, yeah, 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 totally. I, I, I was, you know, I've, I've always uh, loved so many different genres. I mean, this, they're, they're all coexisting uh, all, all the time. And uh, I, I, I kind of had a reservations about doing it because you know, my, my, my heart is more in, in, in to the blues and, and, uh, you know, you know, so Afri- African American influence of jazz and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, uh, I, you know, I listened to BB King interviews and all that stuff. I mean, he listened to <clears throat> a lot of these country guys when he was he was starting out and all that. Um, but uh, when when I was a kid, I mean, th- this is a, aside from from music, but but politics. I, I was I was living in Alabama, uh, in, in Birmingham, and it, it was I think it was 1964, and and, and George Wallace, you know, the segregationist governor. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 he he was I, I think I was thirteen. He was doing rallies close to my house at a shopping center, and and, and so me and my buddies rode, rode uh, our bikes up there to see see what was going on. It was, and it was, and it was. Uh, I mean, it, it was it, it was the closest thing to a, a, a MAGA rally that I ever seen. But they had this they had this country band um, op- opening up the the rally before before he came out and. Uh, I'd never heard a live country band before, and but and they were just kick ass, and they they had a a guy playing a telecast, you know, like and it sounded like Brent Mason and a, and a pedal steel and all that, and and just whip whip the crowd into a frenzy, and uh, you know, and, and me and my buddies we were in rock and roll and soul, and I said, just wow, this is you know, this is pretty hot stuff, you know, and so that that was my my first experience here, here in a country band, even though I I didn't agree with the the politics of the speech and all that. Uh, just uh, 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 the power of the mu- music to whip, you know, w- uh, whip this crowd up, you know. And, yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, American <laughs> music, you know, or you could say Americana, which sort of the umbrella, which all these things fall under, right? You know, in yeah, some yeah. sense, they, they kind of all intersect there. Yeah. You know, there, there there's this great uh, fusion of things happening, you know, like, you know, early Hank Williams and stuff like that following real blues kind of form chord changes and stuff like that and you know a lot of a lot of this music was just influencing each other and rural blues and electric blues and all those things sort of cascading into one another and 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 it is you know a a story of it's an american story for sure you know in terms of how, how all this has come together and there is something that unites everybody you know that that's in there you know that 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 doesn't it's not about division it's not about you know i'm into this music i'm because every music borrows you know rock and roll without blues and country there'd be no rock and roll you know like it's those are the elements of rock and roll yeah 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 definitely i, I was um in the i, I mean in, in the late 60s or early, early 70s I, I think yeah when i first moved to la i was or or or, or Northern California was um we, we we came down to LA and we had this producer it was part of that whole uh, production deal with 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 uh, the Doobie Brothers guy and 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 there was a real slick producer named uh, Dallas Smith I think and 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 he was you know he he wanted to make a pop pop single and, and it, was, it was so slick uh, you know I was just oh my god I was yeah. and I found out later he had uh, he had signed a band called the Hourglass. Uh, um, which, which included uh, Dwayne Allman and and Greg Allman, and 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 that, that it was a similar story with them. It was a few years before we went to California, but uh, but he was trying to do the same thing with them. He he liked the voice from from Greg Allman, and and and, uh, and he was trying to uh, turn them into this slick pop band, you know. And, and they had enough, and they moved back back to 
back to back to Georgia, and the rest is history. And they formed the Allman Brothers. But uh, but yeah, that that whole um, the whole j- uh, jam band thing with with blues and jazz and 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 soul and all that. Uh, that's you know. Yeah, the the Allman Brothers are definitely a force in bringing those yeah. elements together. That, that's a great documentary on Dwayne on Netflix that just came out recently that I, I watched and sort of talked about that whole period and uh then you know him working at muscle shoals and all that stuff is very, very interesting uh, documentary. I, I i love to see it yeah the muscle shoals documentary is great too my my, my nephew lives up up there and in, in, in florence which is right right across the river from from muscle shoals they're, they're they're connected my brother's first, first wife is from up there when you work with artists as a session player or accompanying player what are some of the things you've learned over the years that really are sort of core principles for you when you approach a gig or when you approach a songwriter or something like that. Are there any things that you have top of mind or or are they just sort of in there and you just know them intuitively? Um, as a, as a session player, um, gosh, everybody is so different. I mean, uh, one of the first ones I did was, was Johnny Hooker and he, he was not on the session. It it was, uh, started out as a demo that, uh, and and he ended up just putting his voice on it. But I, I was, um, it, it, it was a ballad, and I was I was bringing all the, all the different uh, influences to mind. I mean, that was I, I just channeled Ray Charles on that one. A, a, as a horn arranger, um, there were some records that I, I did the horns on that uh, I probably put a little too many thirteens and all that stuff. And and, and they were wanted a l- little more traditional blues horn lines. So you you kind of have to go with what you know. You, you listen to what they've done before and what style they're going to put out. They don't want to you know uh, deviate too much from what what they've already done. So yeah. Who who were some of the standout people that you worked with that that really left a lasting impression on you? Well, well in, in the studio, uh, gosh, um, I got to work with Robin Ford. He's one of my favorite guitar players. And, and, uh, yeah, he's awesome. Um, li- uh, li- live? Uh, live or in the studio. Anyone who's just re- really had an impression on you or, or left you with something, because you've worked with so many names, we could go into it. But I- I'm just curious, who were the people who left you saying, okay, yeah, that's something I'm, uh, with something that you took away with, you learned something, I guess. First time I ever worked with Stevie Wonder. First time I met him, uh, it was at Mary, Mary Wells' funeral. But uh, I, I was in the backing group of Hal David's 90th birthday party. Uh, Hal David was the lyricist for all the Burt Bacharach songs, and uh, he had Stevie Wonder close the show. And he was flying back from Washington and, and didn't really have time to uh, to run do a whole run through with him. And uh, he he was in his limo uh, on, on the way back from LAX and uh, he- heading over to the theater where the show was. And he called into the the music director Chris Caswell and. And he he wanted to do a back, uh, back rack song called Make It Easy on Yourself. Make it easy on yourself, cause breaking up is so very hard to do. It, it was it was a ballad, you know. And, and Stevie Wonder called from a cell phone from the limo, and, and, and he called the music director, and he said, well, uh, I, I want to do it as a reggae. And uh, so so he's calling it from a cell phone. And says, you know, hey, okay, here's the bass part. Here's the keyboard part, and here's the guitar part, and here's the drum part. And he... he uh, he he sung all the parts to to the band what what, what he wanted and then the musical director and um so anyway Stevie came out and he's on he's on grand piano I'm, I was on the, I was on organ we, we, uh, just uh, just seeing how his mind works was, was fabulous you know yeah and then um, and then there, there's a chorus on the end and then uh, and he was closing the show and then uh, and and then there's a chorus part and he taught the different parts and says oh no here's the girls part you know and uh, so he taught it to the uh, to the to the through the audience, and that was at the end of the show. And then says, so and all the men sing this, you know, and that, that those are the backup sessions. So he he turned it into this whole kind of a gospel experience. Yeah, you know? he was very very cool. Everybody's different. Uh, I worked with Sam Moore a lot, and and he, he liked to break it down with just like drums and the piano, and and he loved the whole black gospel piano thing. And uh, something I, I I learned from you know, living down south. I, I was I played for four years in a black church in in Oakland, California, and um, so. So, so I, I listened to a lot of that. I listened to Billy Preston, um, and uh, uh, on, on piano, yeah, that, that was a huge influence for, with me. I, I never got to work with Billy. I wish I had the chance to, but I was uh, on the road and couldn't, couldn't get back in time for the gig. But uh, cool, man. Well, as far as the um, this the new album, like 
this this was all written and produced by you, right? The Tweaking Some Twang album? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I started in 2010. I, I started writing some demos. We wrote over Skype a lot. And uh, he wanted to write country, country uh, demos for, for a production deal. My vision was a little more broad than that. So and it's just, okay, can you make it a little more country? And, and, and fi- we, we, uh, we got a few good songs out of it. But, but the, the first song I wrote for the, uh, that ended up on the record was called Hard, hard Times Coming Down Hard. And that, that was uh, getting back Great to how you, how, how, you get, oh, thank you, how you get back to your inspiration. I just turned on the news that morning, and that was 2010. And, and, and there was a huge oil spill out in the Gulf where I live now. Um, it was called the Deepwater Horizon. Huge oil rig blew up, and and the, you know, there's a big platform, but but the drilling uh, pipe goes in like five five miles down t- into the bottom of the sea. We didn't uh, think of any way w- where they could cap that thing. It was just it was just crazy. I mean, and, yeah, and it just kept kept flowing out. I remember yeah. it's horrible. And, and I, I was I'm, I'm watching the videos of all the oil uh, washing up on on the sea where I live now. Now now the beach is white. It's it's clean, but I mean I th- I think there's still God of oil down the bottom but uh and so and so we we, uh we we came up uh came up with the title of hard times coming down hard and 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 we i I didn't want to write this whole eco thing because uh, you know people have their ideas about that we 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 wrote it and the from the point of view of a a a shrimp boat fisherman who, who makes a living from from the sea and um and he had, he had gone through a hurricane. He had gone now. He's going through this oil spill and all that. But it, it was all written more through metaphors than than an act, than actual news events. You know, uh, every song had its own story. But that that was the one that kind of kicked it off. And I think um, I had uh, four or five songs. I think I think it was enough for a record. And uh, and were you doing it as a mix of uh, remote production and local production? Well, at, at that point, there were just demos. Uh, and he had a he he had a deal. He he wanted to start shopping these to to uh, publishing companies and all that. And uh, he he would he would send my rough demos to Nashville to this uh, I, I don't know where he sent them to, and and he would a- actually have live players do do the do the you know the, a, a live demo you know uh, piano bass drums steel and all that. And uh, sometimes he would have another vocalist or or he would have me do them. And he he would pay for the demos and. Uh, and um, I, I'm thinking, you know, the, the demos, they, they were pretty good. I mean, they, they were not album quality stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm uh, so uh, I started this crowdfunding thing on uh, uh, Indiegogo and, and raised, uh, raised about $10,000 on that. And th- thanks to my, my uh, late sister-in-law and a lot of other people, but the, um, um, I, I kind of under, under, underestimated the budget on that, and uh, I put in about uh, three times. You know, I, I put in about n- another, well, a lot more from my own money. But uh, so you took the demos and then you recorded them through a variety of local studios or remote or. Uh, I, I went down to Berkeley, California, uh, at a great studio called uh, Red Rooster, and a friend of mine named Gar- Garth Weber. We we did a, a ton of stuff you know, back when I lived in California, and. Uh, he, he's a great engineer, a uh, uh, killer guitar player. You should check out some of his stuff. He played with Miles Davis and uh, what was his and name? Um, his name is Gar- Garth Weber. Garth Weber, yeah. cool. I'll check it out. Great, great, great player. Uh, he, he's a k- killer uh, uh, blues, blues, jazz guitar player. And um, but um, we did the rhythm tracks at, at his studio. I did some other ones at another studio in uh, Sacramento called called the Track Shack. We just we just laid down uh, pretty much ba- you know bass and bass and drums tracks. I I did scratch uh, piano vocals, and then then I started doing uh, adding overdubs with different people that I want to work with. And then I found your site, Air Gigs, and uh, oh oh uh, uh, amazing players. Uh, you know, uh, gosh. Uh, I saw you had Maria on one track. Maria yeah yeah Mar- Maria Rodrigo Yeva. Yeah yeah she plays on. Joy in the morning, the one I worked with my wife. She's she's amazing. I was ready to mix the song and and you know had the whole thing done. And, and my wife Maria, my wife, uh, her name is Maria. Uh, she loves she loves all kinds of music. She loves classical, Mozart, everything. Uh, she's from Germany and Spain, and she said, "Okay, can you put a, a classical uh, prelude int- introduction onto this?" And uh, I said, "Maria, this you know it's, 
it's ready to mix. It's all, you know, I, I got to send it to the engineer, um, like in two days. And anyway, anyway, I'm, so, so I, I composed this kind of, a you know, cla- classical, uh, film score in- introduction, like at East Stop Perlman, you know, and, uh, nice. and, uh, uh, wrote it out all, all out. She, she had done a solo of violin, violin parts and then, uh, well, with her string quartet, with all the overdubs and, and the doubling, she did uh, 12 parts plus her, her solo violin and a uh, great, yeah, great player. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. So coming to the present, I know you have a GoFundMe page up. Yeah, I had uh, tongue cancer in 2011. It just uh, hit, uh, hit me out of the blue. I, I, I was diagnosed in 2011 in, in British Columbia. You know, they, they told me a, a treatment plan. I, I don't know if I want to go with this, but uh, I, I ended up going with... Uh, six weeks of radiation and uh, one round of chemotherapy and uh, I'm, I'm cancer free, but uh, beautiful, beautiful. Um, but, but the, it, it was a, it was a long recovery. Um, uh, it took me about a year and a half to get my, my voice back. It, it affected my voice and uh, it damaged my teeth. I, I lost a lot of my, my bottom teeth and I can't play saxophone. I, I've done, done a couple of sessions using a, a teeth guard, you know, like the sports guys have, but, but the sound is, not not what it was. I mean, uh, it's you know for for doing horn session stuff, uh, it, it's okay, but for for doing solo stuff, it's a little more difficult. And so I, I'm, I'm I've already raised. I, I've got a twenty thousand dollar goal. I've already raised almost ten thousand. So let's let's bring some awareness to that. Anyone, you know, you can just Google John Lee Sanders GoFundMe, um, and we'll also put a link down there as well because uh, he's got a goal. To reach so he can get some dental implants and, and, and th- thank you thank you david for your great contribution i, I, I appreciate it so much thank absolutely you. absolutely absolutely so tell us take us now to just the present day how how are you doing and and how are you feeling about things and what are you working on and well i'm i'm, I'm doing a still got a lot of a lot of clients from air gigs they come in all the time every week i mean just you know uh just did, did a, a blues track from a band from uh, croatia all, all, all different stuff, and uh, I don't know if I'm doing another record. I, I've got uh, I, I've got so many songs that I, I've never released. Uh, I, th- I think the next album, if I, if I do one, is probably going to be uh, adult contemporary. Uh, you know, my favorite artists are, are Prince, Sting, er- Eric Clapton. I love more progressive pop stuff. Sure. And um, I, I got I got so, so many un- unreleased things, and uh, there's so many great players uh, I still want to work with on my bucket list. If if I ever get the budget for it, I, I'd love to do a big band record. I studied big band arranging in, in the school, and I did a big band tour in Croatia in, in 2014 with, with a, a killer big band. It's called the HRT uh, Jazz Orchestra, of, uh, the National Jazz Orchestra of Croatia. And uh, we, we did a, a, a five-city tour in Croatia with, you know, playing for four or 5,000 people a night at these huge festivals. And I, I was the lead vocalist uh, and, and arranger, played saxophone and keyboards, and... Uh, uh, I'll also share the bill with uh, Zakia Hooker, who's the daughter of John Lee Hooker, and uh, oh, it's great. They're, they're a killer band, some of the best players in Europe, and um, I'd love to do that. Uh, go in the studio with them for maybe you know three or four days if we find the budget for that. Well, that's exciting. And, and is there one thing like if you could, someone said, John, spend all your time doing this one thing, or at least at the moment, what would that one thing be? Or is there one thing? Or you like doing a bunch of things? I, I don't think there's one thing. I'm, I'm, there's so many different kinds of music. I, I wish I had time to practice more. I'm out. You know, when, when you try to do a lick and all this stuff, I mean, you know, we're all limited by our capabilities. And, and um, I, I would love to just be able to, to whatever here in my head, I'd just be able to play, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, we could all, all become better at what we are. Um, I think my voice has uh, improved over the years. I'm 67, and uh, I took voice lessons when I was maybe 14, 15 years old when my voice was changing. And I had a great voice teacher when I was, uh, he was the choir director at, at, at my church in Alabama, and he was also a trained vocalist and all that. And uh, I would start to blow my voice out after a three or four hour gig, you know. And uh, so he, he really helped me to use the right technique, you know, uh, and I found another vo- vo- voice teacher in, in California in the 90s. She studied from Seth Riggs. That was the voice teacher of Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson and Barbara Streisand and all the people. And uh, so she, she kind of showed me how to get my upper range where I wouldn't blow my voice out. So it has helped. I mean, at my age, I hear so many, so many singers that would kind of, uh, you know, they don't have the pipes that they did. Uh, doing the warm-ups and doing, you know, u- using the right uh, uh, breathing and supporting from your diaphragm and all that. Uh, things you learn yeah. that you try to uh, keep, keep with you. 
Uh, I, I got off the, the, the subject matter, but well, if there's one thing, I, I don't think there is one thing. Uh, well, it's interesting because, yeah. you know, like you're you're such a multifaceted musician, you know, from being a vocalist to a songwriter to an arranger to, um, you know, being able to play multi multi instruments and being able to, you know, you do production and all those things. And they probably come very natural to you and you don't probably separate them out much in your own world. They probably all flow uh, together. But, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of focuses when you think about it, right? It's like, there's a lot of things, but over the years, you've developed all those things to a certain point where they're just on probably on autopilot to a large extent. Uh, yeah, yeah. Some, some things are uh, vocally. Yes. I mean, uh, I have to learn a, a new song for a demo, but, uh, some, something I, I really like to do, uh, and, you know, I mean, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, one thing we we think about as musicians, you know, uh, financial security. I mean, that that's um, you know that that's that, that would that would give you the freedom to to really do what you want to do. And uh, you know, it's it's musicians are you know in, in a <clears throat> and and these days with 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 streaming and all that, it's uh, you know I've I've seen you know, what's happened to to my my royalty checks and and, and what comes in. You know, uh, it's just you know um, that's that's a whole whole other discussion for another day. But uh, I, I I took a film scoring class in in the the eighties, and um, from a guy named Dan Wyman. I, I, I was uh, I, I took a course uh, at at San Jose State University, and, and the teacher was a guy named Dan Wyman, who uh, who was a, a staff composer at at Universal. He did, did a lot of a lot of TV shows, did a lot of horror movies and all that. And, I, I would like to do more of that. A film music is just amazing for me. And uh, if I get the time and reestablish the contacts and all that, uh, I would, would love to do more of that. I think I, I, I love the tour, but it, unless you're doing it at a certain level, it's, it's, it's kind of grueling. Um, yes. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but um, with my, my studio set up, I've kind of condensed it down. And, and I have a great uh, sample library with the latest plugins and all that stuff. And, and, and every day it's, it's sounding a, a bit more realistic of, of what you can do. Um, you know, with, with, with people like Maria, I mean, if you need to add, add uh, some, some more real strings and all of that, or, 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 you know, add some live players, I think, you know, uh, it's, I would love to do more of that. I have a, I have a friend, uh, there's, there, there's one, one guy on my, on my CD, uh, Lyle Work, Workman, he's, uh, plays with Sting and, uh, uh, he, he's one of the top film composers on, on Netflix. He's, he's got three or four or five series on, on, on their on their channel, he's and he's he's doing amazing right now. He, he just did an album at Abbey Road last month, but uh, yeah, I, I'd love to do more of that. I mean, if there's one thing I, I can I can be at home, you know, uh, and, and work out of my house. You know, if I if I need to be to a, a bigger studio somewhere for for you know so, some bigger live players, I can do that. But uh, you know, I, I'm uh, a lot of the stuff I'm hearing is it sounds like it, it's, it's it was done. You know the low, lower budget stuff was was done, and uh, you know smaller studios. And uh, I, I think I have the have the ears and and the, the mind mindset and the just uh, the 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 ability to uh, to do that with all the different styles I know. So Absolutely. that's you know I, I would love to do more of that. Yeah. Well, you've been super generous with your time here, and this has been really fascinating for me. So I appreciate it, John. And I I, I wanted to just you know, be considerate, you know, of what you got going on. Cause I imagine you're probably running off to a gig or something tonight, but um, I, I actually, actually tonight, I, tonight I'm off, but, but uh, it's great oh, to good. spend the time with you and, and all your, 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 your clients, your listeners, your uh, man, Eric is, is, is amazing. Wow. What, what a great success story you have, man. Oh, man uh, it's, I feel that way, man. We, we, we're, we're really working to make it better and we're working to, try hard you know there's so much behind the scenes with air gigs with the developers and trying to get things in place features functions everyone wants this that you know and then yeah. you know there's all kinds of stuff but you know it means a lot to us that it's making a difference for people and uh, on both sides like you know for songwriters and producers who are kind of limited you know by their contacts or where they're located or for for musicians looking to you know work and and 
and and do you know expand their reach you know so yeah it really helped me i, I was in between uh gigs and tours and, and my wife and i were living in, in spain on, on a farm uh summer of uh 2014 or 15 a anyway yeah I, and i found air gigs and it was uh, it was great I, I didn't have my huge setup like i have now but but it was i had enough where i could actually uh i could actually record and do vocals and do saxophones or whatever and uh Man, man, it was it was it was a lifesaver this time. I mean, it still is, but uh, yeah, great. So, so, so let's talk about like you know, who are the, what type of services are you offering now? Let's tell you know people who are listening what what they can book you for and um, what you know what what your studio is like and who you sort of focus on or like who, who's who's the ideal client for you and what you can do for them. Uh, sa saxophone at, at the moment. I mean, uh, I, I've got. Uh, I've got one more session I'm doing for a, for a guy. Uh, it's you know three or four three or four saxes. And I, I've written out all the parts and all that. But uh, I, I'm I'm hoping to get this done in the next couple of months uh, with the implants. But um, uh, key, keyboards. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna start posting some more more of the things I've done on, on the portfolio. But I I, I do backing tracks, uh, which sound very realistic. I don't know if you have a a, a market for that. But um, yeah, I mean I mean backing tracks are, are are the same as you know. They're very similar to, to full production demos. You know, this, it's the same process. On the, on, sure. the, on the backing tracks I'm doing for, for smooth jazz, I, I just did one, um, took me three days, but, but I, did a, I did a backing track of, um, of the Phil Collins Big Band on a song called Chips and Salsa. And uh, right. man, man it, 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 was, it was, you know, it was uh, full, full trumpet section, sax section, trombone section, and, and and the uh, rhythm section with with, with per percussion and uh, um, I, I don't know if I can post it. Maybe I can post it on a on a private thing and, and you can hear a snippet of it so you can I'd get an idea. To. But uh, I'd love to. Yeah. So ba basically, but, 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 yeah. basically, you'll create a backing track for for an existing tune. And or... yeah, I, 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 actually, I did one for for a, for a client on air gigs. Uh, um, uh, it, it was from a show called Doc, Doctor Who. And and yep. he couldn't find he couldn't find a karaoke track anywhere, so so I ended up doing one, and 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 that that was a huge horn section with strings and all that. That was uh, that was that was a pretty big production, and uh, cool. I can't remember the price on that. But um, so 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 that I mean, uh, you know, anything from a a, a simple piano vocal demo. Um, I, I've uh, one of the clients was. Uh, uh, for, for me, writing um, writing uh, a, a, a melody to his uh, original lyrics, I do that, uh, and and that that became a, a a huge job. He he wanted a female vocalist on that, but uh, uh, I did a big production on that, and he's released it on uh, on digital, you know, on streaming. So yeah, that's uh, that's what I do. Uh, let's see, saxophones. I do. Um, do you do any um, vocal gigs now on air gigs? I, I I do a a, a few, but I, I've I've got to be a little cautious, but because uh, uh on on the on the usage, you know, because I'm I'm a recording artist, so right, right. Um, I I, I did one, and uh, a woman in, in, in ended up releasing it with with my name, and I and I, and I told her she had to pull it because it was uh, uh, a contract violation. So right. yeah, I have to do a I have to do a contract saying, oh, this is the, and and the same for for co-writing, um, sure. but uh. You know, if uh, but, uh, just yeah. just a point on that, if you want to exchange contracts or make contracting part of your gig, we have no problem with that. So you can include a, a note that, you know, I need a contract as a singer to, you know, verify that you won't use this in any way that's not, you know, according to the terms set here, you know, or something like that. So that's... I mean, uh, they, they can use it for, for demo pur purposes or... Purposes, yeah. Uh, or, or you know, or to play it at a wedding or whatever, or you know, uh, or just for for their personal uh, uh, use, you know, to, to to have that, to have their words put to music, you know. Sure. Um, but but yeah, yeah, yeah. And the songwriting part, that, there's a contract for that. I've got contracts for all that stuff. But uh, and we have some integrations uh, coming soon that's going to make all this a lot easier, more seamless. So look out okay. for that. But, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, they, they, uh, on Legal Zoom and uh, what, what's the other one? Yeah, the, I, th I think they have standard contracts for all that kind of stuff. Also, sure. Uh, you can, you exactly. can, yeah. Well, um, awesome, man. But it's it, it, it's been great talking to you. Is there any 
final things or is there any um, words of wisdom for for anyone starting out who's might walk a similar road to you and any anything or is that everyone's completely different any final oh, thoughts well, I, I i just you know just just in, in general about the music business in, in general um uh, <clears throat> you know with um i i'm i'm hoping to see some just uh you know uh, they, we i i work with ascap and i did a I did a show uh, in ASCAP uh, almost every year and, uh, since 2009 at the Library of Congress, and, and we were lobbying for legislation for, for you know, for you know, a, a better rate for songwriters. Now that streaming has kind of uh, devastated our, our industry, I mean, the whole that's that's a whole other discussion too. But yeah, sure. um, I, I'm I'm hoping to see something out there where musicians are, are compensated, not just not just the writers, but but every, everybody involved. I mean. Um, I think America is one of the only countries in the world where where the artist does not uh, is not compensated for radio, um, which, which is sad. You know, I mean, uh, you uh, some, some uh, you know the the, um, the SAG after a union, you know, somebody that, that the whoever sang the Wayfair jingle, you know, Wayfair da 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 or whoever, sure, um, you know, uh, uh, can, can make a hundred thousand dollars off that little jingle, but uh, but uh, a guy who sang a uh, a lead vocal on a hit record makes makes nothing off a of radio. He made whatever he made, probably made off off the the session fee, you know. But uh, you know, I, I would like to see that change. Right, and, and, and but that's streaming that, kind of made all of that. Yeah, worse. streaming. I mean, I mean, I mean that that was that was bound to happen with digital. I mean, I mean right. once sure. once uh, things went went to CD, you know, and you can make an exact copy of something uh, that that's just the horse is already out of the barn, but. Uh, yeah, you know, that that's just me, me on my soapbox. Uh, I'm I'm, ho I'm I'm hoping things will, will, will change for us. Some somehow I don't know how how it can you know, but uh, a, a more um, fair, e equitable thing for what, what we what we do. And uh, I mean I mean there's there's a lot on the plate with with Congress and and uh, you know and, and all of the world climate change and all that. But uh, that's just m me uh, expressing uh, some well, some no, hope. I I think you got. Yeah, you got to see the the problem before you can point yourself in the direction of the solution, you know. And uh, I think there are different people trying to address it, you know. And it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, where it goes and and who's coming up with creative solutions, you know, to to, yeah. to this because creativity is never going to stop, you know. So hey, I don't I don't think the average person is aware of of of, of how. Everything works and how we get paid. I mean, they don't know what ASCAP is, and I, I, I saw it on records when I was a kid. But uh, you know, I, I I worked in the Starship for two years, and our lead singer uh, Melissa Carey, uh, amazing singer, uh, she she did a, uh, a Taco Bell commercial, and she made a hundred thousand dollars. You know, I mean, enough to put a down payment on a house. I mean, uh, you yeah, know, and it's because uh, she was in the. She was an after of the American Federation of uh, Radio and Television uh, actors, and, and they and, and they fought for all those things. They you know, they they lobbied uh, Congress, radio, and all that stuff, and, and they they got a you know, I mean that was when unions were, were strong, but they still have uh, you know, but uh, you know the just uh, you know we have to fight for those things and try to get. To, I think you know. so. I think so. As as times change and and new technologies arise, things have to shift. You know, and and old things that once were a certain way can be changed, you know, and to, to, like you say, radio or something like that could be addressed, you know, who knows what, what. Could yeah. Be I, I, I think, uh, I, I think it's in, in the, it, it's, it's not just, uh, it's all, uh, you know, um, c creative license and all that stuff. Uh, uh, I, I think, I, mean, I think Elizabeth Warren, I mean, she, she wants to break up the big tech top companies I don't know if she can ever do it, but you know, um, Apple, Amazon, um, you know, Facebook, and all, all these things. I, I, as they get stronger, it's going to be harder and harder to, uh, you know, um, I, when when Steve Jobs came out with the I, iPod, it was just, my God, this, you know, look, look, I mean, wow, a thousand songs in your pocket, but uh, you know, look, look what it's, it's done. I mean, I mean, I mean, he uh, he harnessed the technology, but 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 Apple made the money on not off the software, but off the hardware. Uh, right. But but it, it it was at the the, the expense of, of all of us, and um, it's true. It's I, true. I, 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 I I wish they would have had a little more 
uh, for, foresight to to see you know what 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 it what is done, uh, and 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 now we, now we have a whole generation of, of millennials. I mean, uh, twenty thirty something who who have never actually bought a uh, an, an actual piece of music. I mean, you know when, when I I bought my first Beatle album in sixty four. I mean, I think it was two ninety nine or a dollar. You know, it took me uh, two or three weeks you know of cutting grass to to pay for it. And it's just uh, and and now people have don't have a real a concept of what the value of, of these things are. Uh, if, anyway, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. No, but, uh... <laughs> well, you're preaching to the choir for sure because, you know, in the, growing up, you, you bought an album and you sat with that album and you listened to it as an album and you, and you know, and it was an artist's vision encapsulated in, in, in one, you know, medium, you know? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And there was something to that that definitely has been lost. And, yeah. you know, just the more information, the more data, all that stuff, it's just, you know, it's hard to it's hard to pull that back because people, you know, although the vinyl has a certain, you know, niche audience still today, you know, but at the same time, there's something we don't want to lose there. And there's something we yeah. want to, you know, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I. I, I forget who wrote it, but I, I was. You, you were talking, you're talking about the transition of, of technology. You, you, uh, you know, you went to a party, you went to a friend's house, and he had the new Led Zeppelin album, and was, oh my God, I gotta, gotta. Have, and, and so you went out and bought it. You, you know, wow. You know, I, I, there was only one copy. You, you, you might could borrow it, but you, you, you know, for, for a day. But you, you had to, you know, you had to bring it back and all of that. There was, there was one copy of that. You know, your, your friend had. You know, and uh, now it's just, yeah that. There's a whole concept, not not just uh, recorded media. I, I mean, but with print media and all that. There was there was one copy of that book. You had you had to go to the bookstore and buy, you know, buy that book or go to the library and, and find one. You know, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's just no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I we feel conflicted about it sometimes too. You know, in the sense of technology, it always has these unforeseen consequences that you never think about. You know, you 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 see a a good solution, you're like, okay that's a good solution for, you know, this problem, but it sometimes yeah. creates these other problems, you know, and, and, uh, it's just, it's, it's an interesting dilemma, you know, in, in, in that sense, like pro tools and all these things, it's sort of yeah. how you, you approach them, you know, they, they, um, you know, the one thing I think we're at least feel good about is that musicians are working like they're, it's not about, virtual instruments i mean you can use virtual instruments but it's not about re these are real people working you know working together yeah 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 mm -hmm. and that's what we you know at least that's good but i i have a conflicted general feeling about technology in, in music and like you say that's a whole another discussion you know it's like uh it's sort of this uneasy alliance you know it's got to be it's a balancing act i guess better more best way to put yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just looking to the future and trying to see where it's going. And uh, there's, there's no way to pr predict, you know. Uh, I, I think maybe it's just, it's going to go its, its course. I mean, we can do what we do. And, and I, I I think live music is, is probably the, you know, the, the, the only hope for, for, for saving this. Uh, I, I'm, 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 I was, I'm, I'm rambling on a little bit, but I, I was, my, the, uh, my my brother came in a, a few months ago with with all his grandkids. You know, my, it was the, the the three or four kids from my my uh, and they were all you know from what was the age of maybe seven, nine, thirteen, fourteen, and 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 the music uh, all all the music they wanted to hear was from the sixties, seventies, eighties, and and nineties, or or maybe you know maybe sixties. I mean that was the ones they remember the most. I mean, and and uh, I said, what, what, don't don't you want to hear the songs from your generation? What's happening now? Just no, we want to hear this, this, this. You know, it was kind of inter interesting. Uh, but but that, they they did a study and the uh, uh, of uh, I think it was young people. And, and and they remembered they remembered the songs from uh, from my my generation more than they remember the the current uh, hit, hits on the charts now in, in 2016, 17, 18, 19. You know. Which is which is kind of strange, yeah. I think that's true. Uh, that, that, I mean, that's my experience that's another too. subject. Yeah. yeah, it is, it is. But it's interesting, and it and it's very relevant. You know, like with automation and all this stuff increasing, it's like 
you know, there was some New York Times article recently about AI composing music and stuff like that, you know, artificial intelligence and stuff. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's going to get good at a lot of stuff, you know, and yeah. um, it's just the questions for the next 30, 40 years of how do we deal with this stuff, you know? Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I certainly don't know. Let's put it that way. Yeah. But I well, like music and I like people oh, making music. Oh, that music. was great. <laughs> yeah, me too. That's All right, a... brother. Well, thank you so much for your time. And um, let's get this out there. And um, well, I hope to do another one. Oh, that's great. Great. It's, 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 it's a long one, but I hope, I hope it's interesting. Yeah. Oh, All right. It was. Thank it you. Was, thank man. you, David. Thanks. All right. All right.